Time and again, the world bears witness to truths seldom said. Lend an ear. We promise enlightened, informed conversation. My name is Robert, and this is Seldom Said, the place where conversation matters. Special guest today, Laura Vorier, who has a unique perspective on life in the California area, and especially life amongst those who love their pets as Laura does. Welcome to Seldom Said, Laura. Happy to be here. I wonder if we could start with a little bit of personal background, who you are, where you've been, and what's brought you to this time and place. Absolutely. Well, as you kind of briefly outlined, I'm a pet sitter and dog walker out here in Los Angeles, and I wasn't always that. I was a makeup artist. I lived in Chicago my entire life, and one day I had the brilliant idea that I'm marginally successful in Chicago, that I would go out to L.A. and try my luck out here. Did you have any plans to become directly involved in theatrical life, or did you just want to go into the theater? I wanted to work in film and television, so that was my plan. I was working at a department store in Chicago at Barney's New York as, like, my main job, but I was working pretty pretty, um, pretty often as a makeup artist in film and television and doing a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, corporate videos. So there's a big market for corporate videos in Chicago. It's a major city and a lot of companies make corporate videos. So I would often go on set as a makeup artist and do someone's hair and makeup for their, their corporate video. And, and that was uh, actually a pretty good gig. It was keeping me busy. And uh, there was some fashion stuff and some film and television. And, you know, I just thought it was the natural progression to move out to LA. I, I never thought that it wouldn't go good. <laughs> I guess you never do think it's not going to go good, right? <laughs> you seem always ready to jump and not necessarily be concerned as to where you might land. How does one prepare to be a makeup artist, to get involved in corporate videos, and then jump clear across the country? What was your immediate preparation? Well, I went to makeup school. So I went to Columbia in Chicago, and I completed makeup school and I got certified and uh, I did a lot of TFPs in the beginning and for those of you that don't know TFP means trade for print so basically it's working for free so you can build a portfolio which then you could show to potential clients so there's a lot of working for free in the beginning and uh, you know that, that that's unpleasant <laughs> nobody likes to work and not get paid but you need to have that that book of business that you can show to potential clients you know here's some shots that I got and here's different you know um, makeup that I can do and here's where my artistry lies so I, I was really prepared um, at least in my opinion I was I, I was prepared I was ready and I wanted to move out to California um, I was at a point in my life, both of my parents had passed away, and uh, it was just the timing was right. You know, I, I just felt I had kind of done everything that I was going to do in Chicago. I really felt a sense of, like, been there, done that. I was born and raised in Chicago, and I was sick of the winters, frankly. Um, so I said, let's go. Let's, you know, let's just load up the car and move out to L.A., and that's what I did. I recently interviewed uh, a politician who got his start in Chicago politics and ended up in California, Los Angeles. He always felt that he was a Chicago native simply living on the coast. It's as if one said you left Brooklyn, but Brooklyn is always in you. In point of fact, is there anything drawing you back in the way of roots and memories? No. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the food. <laughs> I mean, the pizza calls me once in a while. Um, but, you know, the reality is, uh, no, I am very much a forward thinker. I, I don't look back. You know, I have a saying that is, don't look back. You're not going in that direction. Um, I, I'm very much, you know, looking to the future, and I think about where I'll live next. I don't think I would go back to live in Chicago again even though I love Chicago, whenever I go there, I, I try and catch the Cubs. I see my good friends. Um, but no, there is no kind of impetus to be like, oh, I want to move back to Chicago. No. Mm -mm. 
A marvelous baseball player named Ralph Kiner once said the most difficult part of an interview is interviewing someone who gives you a one-word answer. He interviewed the catcher of the Mets who kept on saying, uh-huh and no. You've just given me a one-word answer, but thank goodness you embellished it with an explanation. <laughs> certainly, <laughs> certainly appreciate that. <laughs> marvelous laugh. I wonder, when you say all of these things occurred, your primary focus seems to be on the needy creatures, pets and animals. Did you have a motivation to become a vet? You know, yes and no. The, the, the part about being a vet is, you know, the part we think about, at least I do, the fun, furry, the touchy-feely, the happy part, you know, puppies and, and cute animals. But the reality is, you know, you have to deal with a lot of sick animals and unhappy moments and, yeah, you know, surgeries and, you know, the unpleasantries. So I'd rather stick to the pleasant stuff. One of Aesop's fables, uh, allegedly, is the more I look at some people, the better I like my dog. <laughs> have you found it easier working with pets? Absolutely. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um, you know, so much that I love about working with pets is the unconditional love that they give you. And there's something to be said for the childlike quality in our pets. And I think that's why they're so often referred to as furry children and they need us. Yes. But they also give us something that I find a lot of human relationships are lacking and that's the unconditional love. You know, there's no condition. It doesn't matter richer or for poorer in sickness or in health. You know, you, you take care of me and I take care of you. Um, my dog has been with me for, you know, longer than my husband. And, uh, you know, I love him so much. There's real connection there. Also, I'm really connected to my husband, of course, but you know, I love my dog so much. It hurts. Sometimes I see him getting older and, um, I've never lost a dog as an adult, so I think about that, and it terrifies me. You know, he's so much a part of my life. He's my better half. He's my canine soulmate, and I know a lot of my clients feel exactly the same way about their pets, so it was easy for me to step into that role as a caregiver to their pets while they were away because I get it. You know, I get it. Was there an epiphanal moment, that Damascus moment, when you as a young woman, and you're still a young woman now, obviously, decided to step into this full time? Uh, when it started to pay my bills, I was like, <laughs> this is working. And it was really, you know, what happened was I was struggling as a makeup artist in Los Angeles. Um, I wasn't making any friends. I had left behind a community of friendships and other artists and and really was dialed in in Chicago and came out to LA didn't know anybody only you know just the most you know casual of relationships I was working at Barney's New York in in um, Beverly Hills on Wilshire Boulevard which was a completely different experience from the Midwest experience um, being from the Midwest I find we're friendlier we're more warm we're you know nice to strangers I, polar opposite in Los Angeles. Okay. So that was a real eye opener for me. And it was a bit, uh, it was depressing. You know, I was, I was feeling really, um, in a bad spot and a woman came into my life, needed her makeup done on a movie set. She had a dog. She asked me to walk the dog. I was happy to walk her dog, make a little extra money, but also the dog was so cute. It really buoyed my spirits. And when I was walking that dog out of a trailer came the comedian Paula Poundstone. And, you know, in that very Paula Poundstone way, she said, hey, are you a professional dog walker? <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah, I am now. And uh, she hired me and it changed my life. It changed my life. It gave me a chance to walk her dog. And then her neighbor saw and called her up and said, hey, is she a professional dog walker? And I want that for my dog. And. I, I, I never looked back. I mean, as a matter of fact, within the next two weeks, I had sold all my makeup supplies and my kit. I was like, you know what? I'm done. It's not going to happen. I'm moving on. This dog walking thing is really taking off. And I, in fact, was in the right place at the right time because it became a really booming business and at the beginning of an industry. That's incredible. 
You spoke earlier of unconditional love. Uh, it would strike me that you're also drawn, as I and many pet lovers are, to innocent love. There's something about a pet or a dog that is guileless. And we live in a world, especially in the world you live in, highly competitive out there, where guile is part of the game. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, to your point, you know, your dog really doesn't have an agenda. You know, oh, I want to get fed. I want to get walked. I want to sleep in the bed. But, you know, what's the agenda there? Just to be loved, just to get the basics and just to love you. So I think you're absolutely right. That That is a good point. Have you been able to connect to people without even meeting them by simply walking their pet? I think so, yes. You can tell a lot about a person by their pet's behavior. And I think a lot of times pets and people line up energetically. Um, if you have an A-type personality, you usually get an excitable dog, <laughs> a high-energy dog. If you have a laid-back personality, I find the dog is laid-back. Um, and I usually only meet the person one time, in fact. I'll meet the person one time, or I'll meet their handler, or their estate manager, or somebody who works for them, if not them. Um, but I'll meet the dog again and again and again, and, and I really create the relationship with the dog. And uh, I'll text the person and give them pictures and you know give them the poop report. But it's really the relationship is with the pet. I would imagine there is a certain amount of secrecy and decorum that's applied to this. You're literally reaching into a person's private home and taking their pet for a walk out the door. Is there in some way a written agreement or simply a verbal agreement to what you're doing? You know, sometimes there are actual written agreements, especially with celebrities, you know, don't talk to paparazzi, you know, don't say anything disparaging to the media about us, don't mention the name of our kids. But I also think that there there is an expectation of privacy. Uh, you know, you have the keys to someone's home, you're, you're inside their, you know, most private of sanctuaries. Uh, you see their mail, you, you see their prescriptions, you see what's going on, really. Um, but you're there for the pet. And, you know, I, I honor people's privacy. I, I really don't. I'm not a nosy person. I, I know there are dog walkers and pet sitters who are nosy. And that's their human nature. I'm not, not a nosy person. So I do... I do expect and, and respect other people's privacy, but that's a two-way street. You know, something I've noticed in the last couple of years is that I have to ask my new clients, do you have any cameras? Should I be aware of any cameras? Because I don't know if people forget, but they don't want to be forthright or they feel a little shy to tell you that they have cameras in their house. So there is no expectation of privacy anymore. And I always ask my clients, are there cameras that I should know about? Because I did have a few experiences where I didn't know there were cameras in the house. And just by the very fact that I was doing my job, a client called me and then had to say, uh, we have cameras. <laughs> have you ever encountered someone, perhaps a celebrity, who really reacted adversely to their pet and you found yourself betwixt a rock and a hard place? No, not a celebrity. I, I Not a celebrity. Um, I find that uh, celebrities are overboard with how they treat their pets. They love their pets, um, just like us, um, regular people. I say us, regular people. But, you know, I did have a, a situation with a, a couple and they had a, a little Pomeranian and his name was Einstein. And um, he was the sweetest little Pomeranian you ever met. And the man had been divorced and remarried and he had a wife and she came from outside of the U.S. And it wasn't the custom out in where the country she came from to keep dogs in the house as pets. And he wanted to please his wife, of course, like any good husband. So he started keeping his dog Einstein outside in the backyard. Now, Einstein had not been accustomed to the backyard life, and they gave him a little outdoor doggy home, but I felt he was being neglected outside. He was constantly crying to get in. You know, he wasn't used to it. And then the, the rains came, as they do in LA, we're in the rainy season now, and he was just a matted, wet mess, 
And I felt compelled to say something and I said something and I said, you know, Einstein is really, he's not an outdoor dog. He's an inside dog and, and he doesn't have the structure outside. Can you consider um, moving him inside the house or at least building him a structure where he'll be, he'll be dry. And they were kind of close to it. And I, I called animal control on them. I have no problem admitting that. And, you know, I hope Einstein got himself a good home. That was an unacceptable situation. And it was heartbreaking, heartbreaking to see Einstein, this little Pomeranian who had been used to living in the lap of luxury. Now he's outside 24 seven. You've used a number of times that word celebrity. I'm reminded of a study done, uh, of the Southwest by a historian who talked about the Texas Revolution, and he described David Crockett, one of the heroes of that Texas Revolution, and said he was the first celebrity, the first man to be famous simply for being famous. What is your definition of celebrity? Well, we have a lot of celebrities out here, and sometimes people are just celebrities in their own mind. Um, so, uh, you know, a celebrity is, listen, somebody who is a household name, somebody who is recognizable, you know, somebody who you might see on TV or television or a show. You know, news anchors can be celebrities. People that are widely recognized and um, paid for their, their celebrity are celebrities, but you know, we have a lot of people in Los Angeles that are famous for being famous, you know, and, and people who are, who are not celebrities who just wanted to be treated like one, you know, everybody wants that, you know, star treatment and people to, you know, fawn over them and go the extra mile and give them freebies. And, you know, that, that, that happens all the time. But to me, all my clients are celebrities. They're all worth the star treatment. They're all getting, you know, top-notch service. Of course, every celebrity is royalty. Every customer is a celebrity. Do you manage to keep a diary of these daily experiences? I did. Initially, I did. But I found that a certain experience will repeat itself. And that, I mean, you know the client meet and greet or hiring a dog walker when unusual things happen or an anomaly happens. I will write it down in the beginning. I did write it down and that became the book, but now not so much, you know, now I'm, I'm working on, on other, you know, writings that I'm, I'm working on. Um, you know, I think with Sam coasting with the dog business, but I have a lot of people work for me now and I've managed to hire my daughter and she opened a second location. And so, you know, she's in it now and I have the clients that I manage and of course my dog Dexter, but I'm, I'm really sort of, you know, it's, it's kind of like coasting right now. I have, I have it all going very well right now and that could change, but uh, right now it's all good. For the person listening in the listening audience, and who says to themselves, I love pets, I love the warmth of the West Coast, I'm going to go out there and try to parallel and reflect what Laura has done. Would you recommend that, or would you still argue that it was your talent, obviously, but also luck? Um, I'd say if you have the passion and the desire, just like any career, any ambition, you know, you have to have that passion, the desire, the commitment you know, come on out. Uh, anybody that wants to be a successful pet sitter or dog walker in, in the U.S., of course, can do it unless you live in a, you know, very rural area where there's just no need uh, or, you know, people got it covered. I, I find in metropolitan cities, you can pretty much make a go at anything that you really, really put your whole heart and soul into. And the great thing about pet sitting and dog walking is it's a pretty low barrier to entry. You know, you don't need to be, you know, uh, college educated. You don't need to have a bunch of certifications. You don't need to really pass any test. Um, you can just be somebody who loves dogs and maybe has walked your own dog to go out there and give it a try. That's the great thing about it. You know, it's kind of like one, one of my friends said to me, not so politely, we were talking about careers and said, well, Laura, it's like unskilled labor, isn't it? And I said, well, well you know, you, you define skill. Um, cause I know I've hired some people and you know, they lost the dog on the first day and got locked out or set the alarm off. So it's more than just walking the dog or taking care of the pet. It's all those ancillary things that are involved that you got to get right. Mahandas Gandhi yet. Uh once took the opinion to the press that you can judge a culture 
by the way they treat the lesser creatures, animals. Do you feel a person needs to be trained and educated? And have you encountered people who want to love and care, but they don't know how? And then do you become an educator? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I think that Gandhi quote is exactly right. I do think you can judge a culture and a person by how they treat animals. Um, it's just sickening these dog meat markets that we see and, you know, these animal meat markets and hunters, uh, you know, it, it turns my stomach. Um, in my experience, I've only really dealt with people that love animals and want to rescue them. I have been, you know, privy to people who've adopted animals and they were abused and we've had to work together to get past that fear that the animal has and the anxiety and, you know, even sometimes the aggression that's left over from being abused. So I've been very lucky where I, I work with people who love animals. Um, I try and, and go into schools and teach children about compassion towards animals and, you know, basic animal care because, you know, they have found and done studies that people that abuse animals, especially when they're children, will go on to be, you know, abusive and dangerous as adults. So um, that's something to be looked at, you know, teaching children to be kind to animals. And I think most children, you think, oh, it's natural, but you know, it might not be. So I think it's always a good idea to teach compassion and demonstrate what it's like to, t to care for an animal. It's a great thing to give a child an opportunity to raise a pet and be responsible for that pet. It teaches them so many things and it, it gives them so much joy. And I, I think it's, it's a very rewarding experience. There's recently an incident in this area where a child abused a large dog, toddler, caused the dog a great deal of anguish and pain, and the dog, to free itself, reacted to a little nip. Do you feel that any pet can be reached? I know we're starting to have uh, politicized moments here with pit bulls. Many people argue that that's simply a vicious breed and can't be dealt with, can't relate to human beings. Do you feel that any pet with love, care, and patience can be brought to the brink of living with people? I do. I mean, mostly. I mean, I think the great percentage, you know, listen, 90% of dogs are happy-go-lucky. That's just a fact. Most dogs are happy-go-lucky. You have the other percentage that's aggressive, that's fearful, and, uh, that nips, <laughs> you know, that nips. So when is it okay to nip a child? And should that child be, you know, abusing the dog to the point where the dog is defending itself? Um, I don't believe in bad breeds. I, I, I'm, I'm a, um, a very much an advocate for the bully breeds. I've only met the sweetest of pit bulls, the sweetest of the bully breeds. And every dog, just like every person, should be judged on an individual basis. Given your affection for animals and your care for them, their security, have you felt yourself becoming politicized? Have you considered backing legislation, perhaps not a bill of rights for animals and pets and lesser than human beings, but in point of fact, have you found yourself considering getting involved? Absolutely. I, I, I do consider. And, you know, I must sign. I, I tweeted this out once. I must spend an hour a day signing petitions, you know, uh, you know, changing the laws, care.com, you know, just anti-hunting, anti-cruelty, anti, you know, you know, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but there are so many dogs being euthanized and cats, but every day in the U.S. alone. And the, the platform I would get behind is a moratorium on breeding pets for profit. So many animals go into shelters and go into rescues and they came from breeders and they're, you know, indiscriminately breeding pets and we don't need any more pets. There are millions of pets available online and you can get any breed that you want from a breed specific rescue. And, you know, it might not be a hundred percent purebred, but it could be because there's a breeder out there that had to toss a bag of puppies because they couldn't find buyers for it. And so that's the platform that I would run on. And that's what I would get behind. I mean, there is just 
too many dogs being put down every single day in the U.S., and it's really not necessary to bring any more into this world until that is stopped. How would you then, in a very generalized form, describe the American attitude toward animals? Do we live up to Gandhi's expectations? I think I think we do, but unfortunately, I think that a lot of us want to turn a blind eye to this problem of overpopulation. You know, we go to the shelter and we go to the rescue and, you know, we, we take in a dog or two and that's great. That's wonderful. That's what I've done. But I think more has to be done on the other side of that. We have to stop puppy mills. We have to stop overpopulation and we have to stop breeding. And that's not going to stop until we get more eyes on it. I mean, the puppy mill situation is horrendous. I mean, imagine that your, your puppy, your you're locked in a cage and all you do is have puppies. And uh, it's it's pretty horrific what happens at the puppy mills. And they are guarded with people with machine guns. You know, I just was looking at a documentary about the puppy mill uh, situation. It's, it's horrible. And I think I think a lot of people don't want to know that. You know, people, people don't want to see that stuff. It's hard to look at. I recently walked past a pet shop in downtown Manhattan, New York, there were so many small pups in the showroom that they couldn't walk. They were stacked one on the other, pressed against the glass. What legislation would you propose not only to limit the number of puppies, but to limit the way they're treated? We have uh, just passed legislation here in California to shut down puppy sales from storefronts. You know, you can't buy a puppy in a store anymore. You can't do it. You have to find a puppy through a breeder or a shelter or a rescue. You can't just see a store and say, how much is that puppy in the window anymore? So, um, I, I, you know, I'm not a politician. I don't write policy. I know something has to be done. I know I get a lot of, you know, pushback. Oh, don't stop reading. But how is it going to stop? How are we going to stop puppy mills? How are we going to stop all these dogs being euthanized? I mean, it has to be, you know, a simple equation. Yes, more adoptions, but we've got to stop making puppies, you know? We've got to stop. So whatever that looks like to a politician or a policymaker, uh, I know we have taken some strides in the right direction here in Los Angeles, like I said, but more has to be done. It, it has to happen. Does your interest and concern extend to other animals that are used as pets, or are you primarily focused on dogs? Uh, it does. It does uh, extend to other animals. Um, you know, for a long time, I got involved in the vegan movement. Um, did a deep dive into factory farming and what that looked like. Look at every being has a right to its own life and every being wants to live if you can believe it as much as you and I do you know you look into the eyes of a dog a pig a cow a goat whatever it is and there's a soul there and uh, it doesn't want to be dinner so I, I do I do extend it to beyond just dogs and cats absolutely Within the next few weeks, I'm going to be interviewing an old friend who is a colleague of the Dalai Lama's. When you describe pets having a soul, Hindus and Buddhists read into that something highly meaningful. The Western spirituality and the Western culture seems to feel that we are human and they are what they are, but less than what we conceive of ourselves to be. How do we change such deep-set feelings in a culture? It starts with the children, you know, it starts with the next generation. Uh, you know, I am a Buddhist, I'm a Shambhalan Buddhist, and we believe in sentient beings, which are our animals and our humans. And, you know, we we do respect that sentient, sentient being, that soul inside of them. And there's a saying in Shambhala, we say, you know, may no sentient beings suffer. And, you know, they talk about Buddhists not killing ants or killing spiders. Well, that's absolutely true, you know, and, and I don't believe that they are lesser souls. I, I, I never believed that. And, you know, in other cultures, they take it one step further. You know, they actually feel that inanimate objects have 
their own energy and their own source of beingness. And uh, they respect that. So I think it starts with the kids. You know, I, I've taught my son uh, meditation and compassion and, and some Buddhist practices. And I think it starts with the next generation. You know, I think it starts with opening our eyes and becoming, in fact, to, to being enlightened to the fact that everything, you know, we're all part of the same universe. We're all one. And, uh, you know, there's an idea there that every being wants to have a life, wants to have joy, wants to have connection, and really doesn't want to suffer. You're speaking of living in L.A., Driving in L.A., a unique experience, as you're well aware, when one sees the red light, one stops, but preparatory to seeing the green light and going and going very fast. Can you educate that hastenness in society that we so subscribe to and embrace? I know it starts with the children, but the cultures themselves live at 90 miles an hour. And to really stop and look over your shoulder at something beneath your feet requires a reticence that the average American, I would think, does not consider each day of his life. Well, I think you're right, but I do think it's changing. I think the millennials are more mindful. They don't want to work 12 hours a day for 30 years for the same company and get a gold watch at the end of it. You know, they don't drive as much as we drive. They don't see home ownership as an American dream. They're not having kids like maybe my generation did. Um, they're sort of thinking twice about doing the same things their parents did or their parents' parents did. So I, I am seeing a paradigm, uh, you know, switch, especially here in LA. Cause I, I feel like, you know, the two coasts are, you know, kind of leading the way. But I do see this this generation of kids being more mindful. And uh, I do see them embracing this attitude towards a greener planet. We're all one. And what's going to happen tomorrow? You know, th these, these kids, this generation, especially this generation of politicians, you know, they're seeing it. They're seeing what's happening to the planet. They're seeing that what we have done is not working. And in fact, it's backfiring. So we've got to go in a different direction. So I think the eyes are being opened. I, I think we're going to see some real big changes in this country going forward. You're certainly not reticent to express and share your opinions, Laura. Given what's occurring in the news, the Me Too movement and so forth, would you define yourself as somewhat a feminist? Oh, absolutely. I mean, who wouldn't be a feminist? I mean, I mean, it's if, if people know the true definition of feminism, it's just somebody who wants equality. You know, who wouldn't want their mother or sister or daughter to have the same thing that a man has? It's it seems that at this time, it shouldn't be this conversation anymore. You know, we're a hundred years almost past when the women had the right to vote. So I'm past feminism. I'm ready for a female president. <laughs> Somewhere Gloria Steinem is applauding. <laughs> <laughs> She's one of my heroes. Why not? I mean, listen, look at it. I mean, let, let's just face the facts here. Women make up a great deal of the workforce. And why should we make 72 cents or 85 cents, whatever, whatever it is, to a man's dollar when the reality is there's a lot of single moms out there raising kids on their own. There's a lot of single moms out there. There's a lot of single women out there. And if we're doing the same work, we should get the same pay. And that's just... That's just basic human goodness. I mean, come on. I mean, if we're changing, there is going to be a paradigm shift in this country, and I see it. And I see a lot of these, I don't want to call them old dinosaurs, but, you know, we see what the Congress is made up of is how that's changing and how, you know, a lot of these politicians who came up maybe back in the day, they're aging out. And now we're going to see these these younger people taking over, and they've got new ideas, and I'm all for it. You know, bring it on. Equal rights, here to stay. Equal rights, equal pay. Let's go. That's one of the reasons I became a dog walker. I'll tell you, I was in corporate America for a long time before I was a makeup artist, and I saw sexism every single day. I could tell you so many stories of sexism, and me too, but you know what? That's boring. You know, that's old. That's old news. That 
stuff is over. You know, we're we're dawning of a new day right now, and so I'm I'm glad to be here to see it. Returning to the focus of pets and ownership, and of course your book and studies. In point of fact, place yourself as a kind of mentor. Someone who has never owned a pet, particularly a dog, comes to you for advice. How do you match the character traits for the owner with the inherent traits of the pet so that there's a meshing? Well, that's an interesting question because a lot of times my clients will say, we're getting a new dog. Do you want to come to the shelter with us? Or we're getting a new dog. Let's go to the rescue. And I will go with them and we'll talk to the caregivers there and we'll say, well, this is what we're looking for. You need to know what you want. So if, if you're a high energy, lots of activity uh, person who hikes and bikes and goes camping, then, you know, maybe a senior dog is not for you. Um, so you want to look at the family or the person and what their lifestyle is. Um, you work from home. You're not that active. You want, uh, you know, a dog to just be by your side and, and, uh, maybe, you know, not too much biking and, and cycling and camping. So, you know, we find, you know, to match the activity level, but I find that most dogs over time, they get it. They fall into the pattern that the humans have and they anticipate it. And, you know, I've never had a situation where someone has gotten a dog and the dog didn't turn out to be just right for the family. Um, rarely. I mean, maybe once I've heard from another friend of mine, a trainer who said, oh my God, the dog was just too much for the family. We tried everything and it had to get rehomed because they didn't have enough land for it. It needed more than they could give it as far as exercise. But that's rare. I mean, I think dogs are very happy to sort of form themselves to whatever situations they find themselves in. How would you propose training a dog? If it's a puppy, definitely crate training. <laughs> that's a good idea to housebreak a puppy. So that's something that I think most people understand. Um, if you get a puppy, you need to crate train it. So you want to set up that crate so it recreates that den-like atmosphere that they might find in the wild. And that means, you know, covering three sides of the crate. So when they go in it, they can only see in and out of one entrance. And that makes them feel secure. They don't feel like someone's sneaking up on their back. They feel like they could sleep in there. It's quiet, it's cooler. And make sure it's comfortable. You know, put some things of yours that have your scent on it. Um, so I would say crate training. That's, that's the basic thing. And then socialize your dogs. That's a, a big thing socializing your pets to other people and other dogs and other animals really is so important because you want to be sure that when people come to your house your dog's not going crazy jumping up on them knocking them down um so socializing basic obedience training and crate training especially for puppies are really important especially in the beginning when they're puppies because that's when they're learning that's when their brains are absorbing all this new great information and the repetition is really going to teach them what to do and then if you get another dog they teach that dog how to act so it really is a really good system if you always have a couple dogs to always have you know, that young one coming in that the older elders are going to be able to show like, this is where you go to the bathroom, this is where we eat, and this is what we do. So it's, it's kind of nice ritual. Obviously, one can spoil a child. You mentioned that many celebrities treat their dogs as almost a, apparel, basically jewelry. They perhaps overdo it. Do you have examples that you've experienced where the love and the sharing and the expenditure are tremendously overdone? Uh, I do. I do. Um, I had an experience with a woman who had two little dogs and she was treating them like children. You know, she had them in baby strollers. She put them in a backpack. She took them everywhere. She kissed them. She dressed them. She really did baby them in every sense of the word. And um, the one dog uh, developed just separation anxiety, would shake, would bark incessantly, drool, and just developed real, real clinical anxiety. And she said, oh my gosh, what's going on with my dog? Took it to the vet and the vet pointed out, you know, you treat the dog like a baby 
And that's a big expectation on a dog and you know, it's causing anxiety. So you got to knock it off. And actually they wound up putting the dog on um, medication to help ease the anxiety because the person had turned the dog into a baby. And obviously the dog can't be a real baby, a real human baby. And it got to be too much pressure. So I have seen that's an extreme case, of course, where, you know, somebody just put too much pressure on their dog to be a real baby and it's not going to happen. Given what you're doing and what you propose others should do and how they should act, you have mentioned uh, in your book and in articles the hiring difficulties that are inherent in the Hollywood atmosphere. Has that improved? Um, no, I would say no. But I tell you what has improved. I have hired a great group of pet lovers and dog walkers, and they have stayed the same. I really haven't had any turnover. I mean, I need to hire another person now, and I'm, I'm dreading it. I think I'm going to have my daughter do it because, you know, it's really, it's really, I hate to use the term dumpster fire, but it is so hard to hire difficult people, especially in Los Angeles. A lot of people come out here, they want to be actors, they want to be writers, they want to be movie stars, and, you know, they, they think, oh, dog walking and pet sitting, it's, it sounds perfect. But the reality is you have to do it. If it's hot, if it's raining, if you don't feel like it, if your agent calls and says you're up for a part, you know, you have to, you have to do your job. And so many people don't, you know, if something better comes along, they're done with it. They're, oh, it's just a dog. It's just a dog. It won't matter. So, um, to answer your question, a yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned uh, how to treat young animals, particularly pups. You have often concentrated in your statements on the mistakes being made in the treatment of senior pets. Many people in New York seem to rent a dog for the last years of its life. What mistakes have you seen being made in the treatment of a senior pet, and what do you propose to do to change it? Uh, what do you mean senior pets are being rented? I think I lost you there. I see. Okay, to clarify that as an example, a person will look for a dog. I know that out on the Long Island area, many beaches, people will find the dog 10, 12, 13 years old, an older pet, have the pet for the summer, and then leave the pet on the beach. So you have a lot of uh, feral dogs. <coughs> uh, what do you see should be the proper treatment of senior animals? It's easy to love the pup. It's difficult to love the dog who almost has a dropsy in their stride and step. What should we do? Well, wow, that's a big problem. I guess abandonment is a big issue. Listen, uh, you know, I, I think it's completely inhumane. I mean, honestly, I do. That's, that's just, you know, that's bad, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, Senior pets being abandoned at shelters and rescues, you know, that's just a horror. That is, it's no place for a senior pet. First of all, it's terrifying. If you've had a pet for 10, 12 years, it's given you the best years of its life. It's been your true companion. You've, you know, had it grow up with your family and now it's, it's, you know, elderly and maybe it's costing you money or medical issues. You owe it to that pet to make sure that it gets the final shot. I mean, that's just what a decent person would do, in my opinion. Um, I can't imagine that people were uh, or are abandoning their pets, but I know it happens. You know, in 2008 and nine, when, you know, there were a lot of foreclosures out in L.A., you couldn't open the paper without reading a story about a realtor who went to a house and opened the door and here were these emaciated pets because the people left the house and just said goodbye to their pets and locked them in the house and walked away. Um, so it does happen. I, I like to think that it's rare, but the reality is it's probably not. And, you know, I, I think there should be heavy, heavy fines for something like that. And uh, that's something I'd like to see people stop doing, you know, that's just awful. What advice then would you give to the person who's conscientious, who cares, and wants to adopt a senior pet? Not as easy as adopting a pup. Um, there are a lot of shelters and rescues out here that focus on adopting seniors. You know, 
If you want to adopt a senior, I think that's great. I mean, uh, wonderful. Senior dogs are fantastic. You know, they don't chew things up. They don't have accidents anymore. Um, they're kind of laid back. They don't need as many walks. Maybe they're lower energy. And they just want a place that's soft to lay down their heads. And they just want to give you that unconditional love. They know it. They know they've slowed down. You know, I'd say... Make sure you know what you're getting into um, financially because sometimes senior pets can cost more. You know, they might have medical issues. They might need medications or surgeries um, or, you know, prescriptions. So you have to consider the cost of that. But you're going to get repaid that um, in, in love. I mean, it's really something you can't put a value on to get that love from a senior pet. And just to have them look into your eyes and know that, you know, you've done right by that animal. It's really special. I must say that uh, you've written a quite comprehensive book. You do have a way with the word and obviously with pets. What were your reasons for writing The Pet Sitter's Tale? I wrote the book for my friends and family who didn't really get it. <laughs> you know, um, I came out to L.A. to be a makeup artist, wound up being a dog walker. Uh, a lot of them were scratching their heads and going, uh, oh, what happened? <laughs> How did that happen? And then, you know, when I would talk to my friends who were still in corporate America and doing the jobs that I once had, so what's what's a day look like? Like, what, what do you do all day? You just, you walk dogs? You take care of the dog? Like, how does that work? What does that look like? And um, they couldn't. They couldn't see it, and uh, I wanted to paint a picture for what it was like to be a dog walker and a pet sitter and some crazy things that happened and some unexpected things that happened. So I kind of really wrote the book for people who wanted the sort of the insight into what it's like to be a pet sitter and dog walker. Have you developed a creative literary process, Laura, that will allow you to continue writing? Well, I've developed procrastination that will allow me to continue to think about writing. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, a creative process, you know, writers write. That's what I have taped on my desktop here. It says writers write. And if you know, if you want to know what you're going to write, then you must begin to write. Um, I'm working on the screenplay from, you know, adapting the book, the pet sitter's tale. And, uh, I got one, you know, one good effort and uh, I have to go back and rewrite it. And I, I've been procrastinating that. And I started a blog and I've been a bad, bad blogger. Um, I do write the articles when they come along because they have deadlines and I work best under a deadline. So I know that about myself. If I don't have a deadline, then it's never due. <laughs> so uh, I'm, you know, I'm... I'm working on it. You know, I'd love to see myself be more of a, I'm making quote to air quotes, professional writer. Um, I take online writing courses and I do everything in my power not to write. So <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I'm working on developing a process. You know, I, I read Stephen King a lot and he gets up in the morning. He writes 2,500 words every day. There are weeks go by that I don't think I wrote 2,500 words in the whole week. So I'm trying, you know, I, I have compassion for myself. I have a lot of other, you know, people pulling me in different directions and wanting things. And so um, have I developed a process? No. Uh, am I working on it? Yes. Can you then give the listening audience a descriptive process as to how you wrote this book, how long it took you, the steps you made, and the changes and editing that you did for yourself? Yes, absolutely. So I started writing down the stories and the highlights of the stories as they were happening. And I did that for many years because I wanted to make a collection of short stories. And um, then I came to kind of a fork in the road because I also wanted to bring a dog product to market, which I did. And I said to myself, I have to be singularly focused on either bringing the dog product to market, which I did, the doggy do all, or writing my book. And I really wanted to see the dog product get to market. And I was um, obsessed with it. Listen, let's face it. I wanted to be an inventor. I invented a product. I got it to market. And that took a couple of years. 
And after I had that experience, I was really ready to write the book. So I took what notes I had and I typed them all up. And then I started shaping them and editing them and creating the stories. And that, that took a long time too. Uh, it, it, it took another couple years, I hate to admit. Um, and then finally I did have 10 solid stories and um, I sent it to an editor. I did hire a professional editor and she really helped me. Helped me a lot with punctuation, um, you know, just writing fundamentals and basics. And that took a while to get it back from her. And then finally, you know, she edited. I went back and made some more changes. You know, writing is rewriting. There's so much to the process. Um, and I feel like it's never really done. It's just simply abandoned. Uh, so um, I packaged it up as neatly as I could and off it went. And that that I, I hate to tell you how long it took. So <laughs> especially since it's not a particularly long book. <laughs> <laughs> Hemingway, it is said, would drive himself mad putting together the last chapter and last page of a book. How did you know that the pet sitter's tale was finished? That's interesting. You know, I didn't have any problem with, I think, the last parts of it. My struggle and challenge has always been begin the beginning. It's the beginning. Like, just getting it started. Like, finding the right words to start a story. I have no problems with the end. But, um, you know, my problem lies in Once Upon a Time. So, um, I just think... I think if you write the beginning, the middle and the end will write themselves. And again, that's my biggest challenge is writing the beginning. Um, I knew when the book was done, when I wrote one of the last chapters, which is called Your Dog Died. Um, it was about uh, an experience I had where a client went on vacation and their elderly dog passed away when I was house sitting and pet sitting the dog. And I knew I wanted that to be one of the last chapters. And when that was done, I knew that the book the book was done. Your company then, your dog's best friend, what do you provide your customers? Literally, pragmatically, practically? Sure. Well, I like to say peace of mind. Um, you know, we do dog walking, pet sitting. We do overnight stays in their home. I do boarding in my home. I do um, basic obedience training. We do trips to the vet, trip to the groomer. Um, you know, nothing can ruin your vacation faster than not being able to get a hold of your pet sitter, right? Uh, and I've had that happen. I had a client who told me before she hired me, oh my gosh, Laura, my last pet sitter was a disaster. We went on vacation and uh, we couldn't get a hold of her and we couldn't reach our neighbors. And after three days, we were just worried sick about our dog and we came back home and she was there and eating chips and watching TV. And she just never thought she should answer the phone once she got the job. So it ruined the trip. And uh, they learned a lesson. So it's really a lot about peace of mind and being able to communicate with your clients in an effective way. Because if someone sends you a text, as soon as it's safe, you really should text them back, especially if it's about their dogs and their pets. People want to know that they're okay. And some people, you know, they only have a few minutes for lunch or they only have a few minutes in their day to check their personal phone. They want to make sure you checked in. Yeah, my dog is out. It's good. I can go on with my day. You know, a lot of people say to me, Laura, I couldn't do my job if you didn't do your job. And it's so true. If you hire somebody to come into your house every day and take out your pets bring in your mail and, and be the eyes and ears of your home. You want to make sure that they're doing that. Yeah. You know, and that, that really is peace of mind. Rather curious as to how you balance so many plates in the air, a wife, mother, business person. Was it easy to do in the beginning? Uh, I kind of eased into that because when I first started, I was just, you know, the business owner and I kind of, got that to a place where it was going pretty well. And I got the, you know, the hiring, once you have, you know, good 
team and good employees and independent contractors, it makes your life so much easier. So once I hired somebody to kind of be an assistant manager and do some hiring and got another location up and running, it was easier easier to take on more responsibilities. But in the beginning when it's just you and you're working 24-7, literally working 24-7, then there's really no time or energy for relationships. But it came naturally once that time sort of opened up, it, it just became natural to take on, you know, maybe more of the, the personal parts that were kind of missing. How might those in the listening audience who are drawn to your statements and your opinions, who share them, in fact, how might they gain contact with you, perhaps by website or share the information that you proselytize? Oh, absolutely. So you can check out my website, which is the Pet Sitter's Tail, and that's T A L E dot com. Um, but I'm pretty communicative on Twitter. Like, that's my social media thing. Uh, so that's also the Pet Sitter's Tail, and they can tweet to me. They can also email me. Uh, that's just Laura at the Pet Sitter's Tail. And uh, I love that. I love talking to people who share a passion for animals and people always send me pictures of their puppies and their pets and their senior pets. And I love that, you know, and, and I have my email there in the book too. And uh, if you aren't sick of the sound of my voice, they can also get my book on Audible because I narrated the entire thing. That's marvelous. How do you feel about that? I have a lover of books. And people less and less listen to books. I know so many colleagues on campuses and so forth who listen to a book while driving. What is your reaction to that? You know, it's it's a disruptor. I was just reading an article that said more people are listening to books than they are reading books. It's, you know, disrupted traditional publishing. Um, I get that. I get get that. And I have um, a lot of feelings about that. Um, I grew up in books. You know, my parents really didn't have a TV when I was, you know, a young woman. And we didn't, when we, when we had a TV, we didn't watch it. There wasn't that much TV to watch, let's face it. Um, so I was sort of formed on books. You know, that's where I used my imagination. That's where I got lost in other people's lives and just escaped into other worlds. And I don't know if you get that same escape from listening to a book. Um, I don't listen to that many books, I have to admit, but I know a lot of people who do, especially when they're commuting and on the trains and in their cars and planes and whatnot. And I think they're they're a great tool for somebody who wants to get information or be entertained by a book and doesn't have time to read or doesn't like to read. I'm still a reader, but I also have discovered the joy of listening to books. And I am listening to books right now um, at the same time as I'm reading. So, hey, I get it. And like I said, it's like it's part of that whole paradigm shift. You know, people used to read and now they listen. Um, people used to not treat women as equals and now they do. So, you know, hey, onward. We're within two minutes of what has been a marvelous interview, a very unique interview in point of fact. Can you uh, share in those few minutes we have your plans for the future? My plans for the future? Well, uh, working on the script, that's, um, that's my big goal because I did write one script and I'm rewriting it. So it would be an adaptation of The Pet Sitter's Tale and it would have a lot of women leads. And it would be sort of like from zero to hero story for all the characters. And I'm working on that. And I, I'm really um, hopeful because you see so much content being produced. I mean, look at all the streaming content. You've got Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and, you know, uh, you know the streamers have, have streaming. So, uh, you know, channels have channels. So I'm pretty hopeful about getting that script out there and getting that produced. Um, I would like to create a bigger platform for myself and create uh, a vlog. Um, but just to continue to enjoy my life. Listen, my husband, and I like to travel. He's semi-retired. We're going to Italy in June. Um, I'd like to save a lot of animals and continue to work with shelters and rescues and, uh, 
continue to raise my kid and enjoy my children and live happily ever after. That's my plan. Going to Italy. Dante once said that when walking down a street in Italy, love is in the air. You just blow a kiss to the wind. Are there any final thoughts you have about your experiences, your love of pets, and what you'd like to share as an emotion with a listening audience? Oh, this is a good one. You know, my final words are adopt, don't shop. And if you have enough room in your house and your heart for one dog, you have enough for two. <laughs> so go out and get yourself another dog. You won't regret it. Laura, you have been an excellent guest. Uh, interviewed people halfway around the world, interviewed people in New York City close by. But you've really held the interest and you say things that really deserve to be said. It has been our pleasure. If you would stay for a few minutes upon completion, we would like to speak to you privately. But the program has been seldom said. Our guest has been Laura Voyer, who is just a pet lover extraordinary. Thank you, Laura. Thank you.